Hey guys, welcome to the roller coaster ride at day 15 of the Grinding It Up Challenge. Played a session yesterday night at 16NL and this morning again at 10NL Zoom Poker and some 10NL Deep Stack. Reason for this being my 16NL shot didn't go all too well and I dropped a little. So, uh, peak was right there yesterday when we left off and uh, I dropped a couple of buy-ins at 16NL, uh, actually just about three buy-ins. If we have a look at the stats here, I was at plus 24 bucks yesterday and I dropped to minus 22. Uh, well, yeah, I couldn't do all that much about it. Um, I mean, there was just stuff that didn't go my way. Uh, flopped, a good, fl flopped a couple of good hands, uh, like I said, uh, didn't hold up when uh, somebody caught the shot with a straight draw and it got there and stuff like that. But, um, you know, there's one rule in this whole video challenge and it's gonna be, I'm not gonna show you any bad beats at all, I'm not gonna be talking about bad beats at all. Uh, I'm not gonna go into any kind of whining mode or complaining mode, whatever, whatsoever, and you shouldn't be doing that either because it's just gonna prevent you from focusing on what's real important. Uh, just be happy when the money goes in and uh, even if the opponent gets there, uh, it's just the natural way things have to go at poker sometimes. So yeah, I uh, had a pretty rough swing, uh, dropped from the peak right there down to this morning, and this was the lowest point actually, just thought that, well, this is not going to end well, <laughs> but it actually did because I, I worked my way out of it again uh, for the most part. Um, so if we have a look at, the, I can't really get it to the to the bottom. There we go. That's the bottom. So the bottom was 267. Dropped there from 330 something. So seven stacks, seven 10 NL stacks. Uh, most of that was lost at 16 NL, as I said. And then uh, I started playing 10 NL Zoom this morning again and uh, added some 10 NL deep stack tables, which were actually quite. Uh, soft, quite good tables to be playing. I can really advise playing those tables from time to time. And there's, as I said in the last video, it's uh, it's really something uh, that's good in the uh, transitioning process between 10 and 25 and L to just uh, take a shot at deep stack poker, or instead of playing 16 and L, take a shot at deep stack poker in 10 and L. Um, so uh, what else? Yeah, I managed to get out of the red. Uh, at the regular tables at 10 and L. Something peculiar that I found is, well, something that I've talked about in previous videos also. Um, I just can't seem to be uh, turning a profit at the regular tables anymore. I somehow I might have lost touch to them or uh, might have lost the feeling as to how people uh, play at these kind of tables and just uh, got my mind too focused on Zoom poker. Uh, but well, I mean, in Zoom I'm doing uh, far too well to be leaving that out, so um, there's not, not much point in uh, focusing too much at playing regular tables, but I will do it, as you see. Uh, well, the sample size is already small, so you can't really tell anything um, from those small samples. Um, four stacks at 5NL, uh, half a stack plus at 10NL, and then uh, only about 1.5 stacks lost at 16NL, so yeah. Uh, not much to be said about this at all. Uh, just keep it up and see uh, how that goes in the future. Right, so let's get into questions of the day. First of all, um, there was a hand that uh, a user addressed here that he saw me play at the deep stack tables. Um, and I actually have that hand somewhere here. Let's see, I think that's the one that he meant. So we're going to look at it. And uh, what he pretty much criticized about the hand, and he's absolutely right in retrospect, is I might have missed out on some value. And uh, that's something that I talked about in the uh, last episode too. Um, it does happen, and it does happen a lot if I play too many tables. And that's what I'm currently doing. I'm playing a lot of tables because I want to get more volume in, and I want to be playing uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hands, um, try and, and uh, boost the bankroll as quickly as possible to be able to move up as quickly as possible in the challenge um, but well um, you know on the way a lot of value um, which I'm missing which could potentially add to my win rate um, that's something that I should be looking out for and that you guys should be looking out for too 
So don't do it like me, don't play too many tables at once, because uh, to be honest, when I when I start my grinding it up session in the morning, it's, it's early morning hours and uh, all I'm thinking about is, uh, okay, I gotta get hands in. So fire up tables, fire up four zoom tables, then on the third monitor I'm firing up all the other tables and then just click, 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 click. And then you go like, oh, I could race here, but well, I'm just gonna call, I don't have time, I got like three other spots over there, so click, 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 click. And there you go, value missed. And um, yeah. I mean, if you can make up for it by getting more hands in and um, exchanging, pretty much exchanging uh, the time for uh, the value or the, the number of hands for the value uh, that you're losing, then you're fine, of course, but it's pretty much not optimal poker, of course. Uh, so here in that spot, um, I raise with 7-6 and a small blind flatted. Uh, who seems to be a recreational player, but I can't tell from the stats on 37 spots. So flop a gut shot and I check it back. This is also something that I could consider C betting, but given the draw heavy board texture, I guess uh, checking back is also quite a good option here. I will get called or raised quite often and I, um, I do have a little equity for my hand. I can also blow somebody off uh, a, a weaker hand, like a small pair or something uh, on later streets. So no need to bet here. Um, and he bets on the turn and I call and I think that's the first mistake. So um, the user at YouTube pretty much criticized why I didn't raise the river for value. Um, I actually think that this was an option. I did call the turn and the river was a blank and he bet and I called. Um, but the real option here, or the real, um, the real uh, spot, the sweet spot for value is on the turn, I think. And I think I should have raised the turn for value. Um, there's a lot of hands like two pair sets, straight draws, flush draws, pairs plus draws, draws like these that will definitely call the turn raise. Um, in this specific case, I wouldn't even have uh, made any more money than I did from this hand. But uh, you can argue like that. I mean, that will be results oriented. Um, but the real thing is, Raising turn for value is mandatory here because you can get so many calls from wars from draws and that's the real value street So you're absolutely right criticizing that spot and uh, I feel guilty of missing value here And uh, I've probably cost myself a lot of sweet value spots by just uh, Playing too many tables and not really focusing much so that's something that you guys might want to improve on too So good piece of advice here Don't play too many tables <laughs> uh, As simple as that so that was that hand. Now, another question, and this is quite an interesting topic to get into and quite a complex one too. Uh, so, I know it's a step back, but 10 and L zoom, you have a large VPIP and a lower preflop raise. How does this convert into profit for you when you flat? When I flat on the cutoff and the button, I'm dominated or blown off my hand. I attempt to try and capitalize on my opponent's mistakes, but it usually ends up with me making mistakes. Any app would be great. So, yeah. Um, this is a very complex topic and it's hard for me to give uh, specific advice, but I can give you some guidelines um, and the guidelines would be, um, first of all, look for stack sizes, look for opening sizes. People do open with different sizes. People have different stack sizes. So when you're a little, you're looking for spots, when you want to flat on the button or in late position in general, you're looking for deeper stack sizes, more post flop room to maneuver, more implied odds. So look for deep stack sizes. Um, you should also look for small open sizes. So for instance, if somebody opens 4x or even 3.5x, uh, he's not going to make it too profitable for you to be flatting speculative hands on the button. And you also have to look for opponent types, like against tight regulars who might be folding when your draw gets there, uh, or against somebody uh, who's just a, a pretty solid player, uh, you shouldn't be looking to, to flat in these spots. So it's definitely highly opponent specific, it's stack size specific, it's opening size specific, and also you have to figure out what hands play well and flop well. And that's something you gotta do yourself, and you gotta see for yourself against different opponent types and uh, their specific tendencies. So the only kind of guidelines that I can give you are these. Um, and the real, the real art um, is to to uh, to be able to uh, to find out at which points post flop you can actually make money off people by either blowing them them off their hand by let for instance raising or uh, bluffing the river or bluffing the turn or whatever um, or to be able to make money when you get there when you make your draws uh, being in position. Um, as I said, there will be people who just check fold when the flush gets there. There will, will be people who, who just check fold when there is a four card straight on board. So uh, don't be too willing to uh, 
open up your game in late position just because you see me playing so many hands. The hands that I'm playing in, in position, mainly I'm playing because I figure that the specific opponent that I'm looking at with the given stack size, with the given opening size, with my hand category, with the range that I put him on, I think that I can turn a profit post flop. So don't just randomly go ahead and flat any types of hands because you see like the Flicks is uh, playing like 30-20 and he flats like so many different hands. Um, I must be doing something wrong. That's that's not the right approach. The, the right approach should be what kinds of hands are you, specifically you, able to play profitably post flop. And um, if you find that you're going to be put into spots where you can't find an exit or where you think you're making mistakes, then just leave those spots aside for, the, for, for, uh, for now and check back later. Just try some things out against different types. And you don't have to play it that way. Poker is a, is a, is a game that you can play profitably in so many different styles and you don't have to like emulate or copy whatever every what anybody else does uh, to be successful and uh, if you feel that you're making these kinds of mistakes post flop you're prone to making them against certain types of opponents then that suggests maybe those spots aren't as profitable and you should leave them out and look for for others instead so that's pretty much all i can say about this but very very interesting uh, question and interesting topic and then there was a question at poker school online that i promised to get into by birde and he said that just wondering if you could address red spade equity if you think it has made you lost or win more at the micros. To be honest, I think I've talked about this uh, a lot, uh, also in an interview, I think, that I did for the PokerStars blog. I think that it evens out in the end because there are so many people that are reacting differently to a red spade. Some are playing tighter than usual, some are playing looser. Some are getting more aggressive, some are getting more passive. Some are really afraid to make mistakes, some are really not afraid to put money in there and just clash heads with me because they, they say it to themselves, well, I'm, it's so much fun to play a hand against a, a pro or against a team onliner, you know? So, uh, well, that can go in either direction and you gotta find out who's who and who does what and for what reasons. So, again, it's uh, an opponent-specific thing, as poker always is, and um, it's my job to figure that out. And it's it has made things for me uh, a little bit tougher because I have to figure that out now. But uh, to be honest, I think profit-wise, it just evens out because I might have like lost more pots to people who are really ramping up their aggression against me uh, because I, I didn't stand the heat or I just uh, whiffed out somewhere. Um, and on the other hand, I think that there are so many people who might have given me more payoff than I actually uh, would have gotten. But, you know... You never know. Um, that, that, sound, that sounded great, right? You know, you never know. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's like that. You don't know how people are um, and how people react. They all react differently. So I wouldn't too, put too much uh, emphasis on, on the, the red spade equity as such or whatever, because I think it evens out, as do the swings. And there we are, closing the circle. Swings are evening out. My EV curve is uh, approaching my real curve that's just to show you because I I addressed this in a previous video uh, where somebody said uh, I'd like to see your EV curve and it was like um, I had like a difference of 10 stacks or something and I'm only four stacks above EV as you say but you know we're gonna untick this and never look at it again because it just doesn't bother us at all who cares about EV everything will even out in the long run anyways so nothing to do about this right that's it for now Hope you enjoyed the video. Keep grinding it up, guys. See you tomorrow.